The story of Theodore Newton Vail, pioneer in intercommunication. Vail was born in New Jersey in 1845. Best known as the president of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, he came by his interest in this field naturally. One member of his father's family had manufactured the engine for the first steamboat to cross the Atlantic. Another had been associated with Samuel F. B. Morse in developing the telegraph. Vail himself learned telegraphy as a young man, and hearing of the opportunities on the Union Pacific Railroad, then under construction, secured a position as night clerk in Pine Bluff in the Dakota Territory. One day he and his brother Alonzo were hunting on the mesa. I sure hope we get some fresh meat, Ted. I'm mighty sick of salt pork every day in the week. Well, once in a while we can bag a partridge. We'd have to go farther out. Uh, you can't get me to go out much further. My hair ain't so much to look at, but it feels a sight more comfortable on my head than bobbing around at some Indian self. <laughs> Wait till you've been here a while. I was scared, too, when I first came out. But I don't expect to be here much longer. wonder if Uncle Ike Quimby got my letter. What letter? I asked him to see what he could do for me in Washington in the mail service. Oh, not just a post office job somewhere, but on one of the mail trains. They get pretty good pay. Yeah, the trouble with any post office job is the uncertainty. Gosh, it might only last till another election. Oh, well, there are drawbacks in any job. But I just kind of like the idea of the mail service. Seeing that the folks that come out here get word to the folks back home. You know, Lonnie, someday people will be able to talk to each other when they're miles apart, sitting at home, passing the time of day. They're going to need awful loud voices, Ted. <laughs> oh. Well, maybe I got a little ahead of myself there. Still, I bet somebody will figure out a way so folks can talk to each other without stirring a step. Maybe you're right, Ted. Lots of things happen folks they couldn't. Yahoo! Jump in Jerusalem. Must be Indians. Let's get going. I'm going to take a pot at them. No, no. That's their trick to draw your fire and get you in range. You're getting closer, Ted. Let them have it. Hey. Hey, what's going on there? Wait. They're not Indians. They're soldiers. Oh. That way, in for it. Orville. Yes, yes, sir. We've been looking for you. What are you trying to do? Kill us? We ought to arrest you both. Well, we, we thought you were Indians. Eh, you must need specs. Mr. Hoyt here wanted us to help him find you. Yeah, I got something for you, William. Got pretty scared when I heard you was out hunting. Black has been busy. Oh, still quite a pastel of folks. Well, here it is. Oh, official business, it says on the top. And reach down below and says, find Vail and give it to him. Now, what's it say? Well, just a minute. Yippee! I got it. That's yeah, what? Yeah, what, what is, is it? it? What do you got? Appointments. Route hmm. agent on the Union Pacific for government mail. No more punching a telegraph. Oh, oh, no. What do you want to do now, Ted? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, I do too. Say, anybody got any money? I'm going to get me a store shade. <laughs> In the mail service, Vale began his characteristic improvement, and his rise was rapid. After a few years, he was made general superintendent of the United States Postal Department. But to a man of his energy, the blindness and interference of Congress was intolerable, and he began to look for another field for his talent. He found it in a newfangled invention of an obscure professor, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, who called it the telephone. Soon, Blase Washington was astonished by the announcement that Theodore Vale had resigned from the Postal Service. One warm day, a discussion is going on in an anteroom in Congress. Why, you must be crazy. Vale's a smart man. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, I saw the resignation. Vale's eyes, Cannon. Uh, what in thunder is he going to do? And tell me he's going into that thing invented by a man named Bell. Confession that talks over a wire. Well, that's too bad. I always like Vale. I'd like to talk to him and give him some advice. You got your chance, Joe. There's Vale now, going into the committee room. My glory, I'm going to do it. Vale! Now, Mr. Vale! Maybe I can talk some sense into him. What's up, Joe? Uh, Horton says you're quitting the service for a job promoting that gadget of Bell. Is that true? Absolutely, Captain. Why, it's the most marvelous thing that's been invented since the telegraph. Yes, I've heard all about that from Hubbard. We're yeah. going to have a network of wires from house to house, city to city, all over this country. <laughs> all we need to get started is a little capital and the confidence of the people. You're going to need a good deal more than that, Vale. I've heard Western Union is putting out a telephone, too. And it's a lot better than Bell, that fellow from Menlo Park. What's his name? Edison invented it for him. Cannon, it's going to take more than Western Union to whip us. 
Dr. Bell's patents are registered prior to Edison. Uh-huh. Yes. And if we have to fight this case, we'll fight it. All the way to the Supreme Court. Bell's statement was a prediction which came true. Western Union finally relinquished its claim and sold out to the Bell Company. But this was only the beginning of a struggle. The Bell telephone, in its original form, was a crude and primitive thing. The conversations were disturbed by noise, and the wires could not be used for long distances. One by one, these obstacles were removed, but greater ones lay in store. Vale left the telephone business for a time to regain his health, and under other management, service deteriorated. The Bell patents lapsed, and competing companies sprang into existence. The Bell system was denounced as a monopoly and trust, and many threatening incidents occurred, especially in the smaller western cities. What's going on out there, Mr. Phillips? You think I'm exaggerating about the reputation our company has out here. Now, I want you to hear what this crowd thinks about it. Well, who are they? Ever hear of populism? No, can't say I have. It's a mixture of political party and social philosophy, which attacks wealth and claims to be for the poor and downtrodden. But what makes populists important to us is their intense hatred for the Bell Company. Why? Mostly because it's a symbol of power, monopoly, that sort of thing. Ever since the Bell patent flat and all those independent companies sprang up, we've been having trouble. But chiefly because of our pig-headed executives. Now, wait. Let me open the window. I repeat, the Bell Telephone Company is an octopus clutching us with its tentacles and sucking us into its maws. Well, what are they so angry about? Because our company bought the local independent telephone outfit for a song. Then somebody had the bright idea to order all the telephone instruments and equipment in the city to be piled up and burned. Shall we endure this humiliation? Down with tyrants and superfans. Fill their fresh fuel to the fire they started. Pile them up over there, boys. The spirit of our forefathers who fought at Bunker Hill and Valley Forge will blaze anew. Long live liberty! <laughs> well, when in doubt, all was call on the spirit of 76. Very true, my cynical friend. But meanwhile, they are burning several thousand dollars worth of Bell property, and there isn't a thing we can do about it. Short-sighted executive policy finally caused alarmed stockholders to demand action. So Theodore Vail was brought back from his Vermont farm to become the president of American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Under his wise guidance, conditions in the organization were improved, and it was an eventful day for all when in 1915, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas A. Watson were about to reenact between New York and San Francisco their first historic conversation, which had occurred over the first telephone. At a banquet... At the New York end of the and line. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we must agree that this great achievement, the linking of the East and West by telephone, is due to the efforts of the telephone engineers, backed by the courage, sagacity, and vision of our president, Theodore Newton Dale. Thank you. Excuse me, but word has come through that Mr. Watson has nearly finished his address in San Francisco. It's all right. I am quite ready. Quite ready, Mr. Carty. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bell and Mr. Watson, who was his assistant at the time, will reproduce the first conversation carried over a telephone wire. And they will use the original instrument. Mr. Watson is in San Francisco. <laughs> and later, we will have the honor to hear His Excellency President Woodrow Wilson from Washington, D.C. And an address by our own president, Theodore Vail. They will both speak to us by telephone. Mr. Bale will speak from Jekyll Island off the Atlantic coast. Now, each one of you has an instrument before you. Oh, oh there's the signal. Now, everybody, lift his receiver. It's all right, Dr. Bell. You may proceed. Mr. Watson is listening in San Francisco. Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. 
Just a moment, please. Mr. Bale, they're ready for you, sir. Yes, yes. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bale. This is Woodrow Wilson speaking. I've just been talking to Mr. Watson and Dr. Bell from morning. But before I give up the telephone, I want to extend my congratulations to you on the conservation of this remarkable work. It's an historic achievement, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. I have heard that you've been ill. I hope you'll be well, too. Goodbye, Mr. Bale. Goodbye, Mr. President. And now, we will hear from our chief, Mr. Mayo. Thank you, gentlemen. It's rather hard to put my thoughts into words at this moment. Ever since the inception of telephonic communication, I've wanted the Bell Systems to be of universal service, to reach every house in every little hamlet from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Today marks the realization of that dream. You have heard Mr. Watson in San Francisco, Dr. Bell in New York, His Excellency President Wilson in Washington, and now I am speaking to you from Jekyll Island. For my own part, I am indeed grateful to have been one in this great adventure. To Mr. Watson and Dr. Bell, my congratulations. And to you, people of the United States, I thank you. And so ends the story of this man of vision who saw the possibilities for human progress in the first crude telephone and identified himself with it not for self-aggrandizement, but for the benefit of mankind. Theodore Newton Vale, Captain of Industry.